Good to be with y'all. Um, all right, Elizabeth, come on in. We have a handout, and we are studying the articles of our Christian faith, the 12 articles, which are also known as the Apostles' Creed. So um, this is going to be a, a two-part study. That's what I'm planning. We're going to study um, tonight, introduce, reintroduce the Apostles' Creed, and uh, go into the 12 articles. Now, this two-part little mini-series actually also has an additional part which is like the prequel or whatever, whatever you want to call it. I don't know what that call, what's that called, or the sequel that came first. But uh, Reed did a deep dive for us on uh, the clause, the phrase, he descended into hell um, on July the 5th. And you can, if you're watching online, you can access this. It is up right now on our YouTube, on our Facebook. So I would encourage you to go back to the July 5th study as well. It pairs with this more general overview. And just because, uh, you know, it was great. Reed wanted to go ahead and dig into He Descended into Hell and did a superb job covering a whole lot of the history, also kind of introducing uh, briefly the Apostles' Creed. I'll return to kind of briefly introducing a little bit more of the Apostles' Creed introduction tonight, but the other thing is, it just continues to strike me as I just map out um, the scripture related to the creed that this idea that, um, that definitively we know absolutely that because Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today I will be with you in paradise, that means he was with the Father immediately, he basically ascended into heaven once and then came back down somehow and then ascended again after the resurrection. I don't see that scripturally, so you'll see some more scriptures. Uh, Reed covered several of the key scriptures last time because we also had this devotional in the table talk, devotional about uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, so Reed dug into that pretty heavily. I'm not going to return and recover re that uh, territory, but I am going to look at a couple other passages as we move our way through tonight. So tonight, a review of the 12 articles of the Apostles' Creed. Now, the 12 articles are kind of a point of reference, you sometimes get variations on exactly how you break out, certainly the Christological part of the 12 articles, uh, but the 12 articles roughly reflect a Trinitarian faith that is consistent with the Bible, the biblical witness to who Jesus is and what our basic faith is, and is also consistent with what would be called, broadly speaking, the apostolic faith of the early church that was reiterated and made clear over the first several centuries in the West. Uh, Reed said this, I know, back on July 5th, and let me repeat, the Apostles' Creed is, arose out of the first several centuries of the primarily and specifically the Western church, okay? As Protestants, we all branch off out of the Western church tradition, okay? There's the Eastern Orthodox tradition. Also, there are smaller traditions, such as the, uh, the Coptic church and the Armenian church, not to be confused with Armenian, okay? The Armenian church, which is called the Armenian Apostolic Church. A lot of times you'll hear people call it the Armenian Orthodox Church. It is not Armenian Orthodox, it's Armenian Apostolic Church, there's the Coptic Church. Uh, the Coptics and the Armenians bailed out of all the church councils in advance of Chalcedon, okay, which had to do with how you understand the two natures of Christ. Uh, they basically got out of the church council group thing after the, the series of meetings over the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed is the actual ecumenical official creed, and uh, it, it, it was developed over several councils. You know, we say the Nicene Creed, often we say, we've been saying it recently in connection with preparation for partaking the Lord's Supper. I previously had us affirming the Nicene Creed on certain special worship services such as Christmas Eve, okay? So uh, you're familiar with the Nicene Creed. That is the official ecumenical creed 
uh, basically the, in, when I say ecumenical, that means like the entire Orthodox Church. These terms are confusing. The Eastern Orthodox, that just means people who followed like this standard, like we believe in the Trinity and those types of things, okay? And as the church developed over the first several centuries, there were many people who came up with many new understandings or interpretations of the Christian faith, okay? And so it was always important that in the uh, biblically believing church that was connected with the apostolic tradition, that we say what we believe, and part of when we say what we, we believe, we're clarifying that we're not part of the heretical groups that are developing new ideas, such as that, well, there's really only one true God, that's the Father, and Jesus is kind of like a, a secondary, lower level semi-God, for instance, or demigod, that kind of thing. Um, so let's look at this now. What I have first, I just wanted to remind you of this. In the Bible, in the Great Commission, at the close of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus gathers with his 11 apostles. Now, Matthew uses the term disciples, but Matthew tends to use disciples to mean the apostles, okay? So Matthew tells us he's with the 11 disciples, what that means for our purposes, Luke is a lot more clear on this. You're talking about apostles, okay? The inner group. Now remember, as we've been focusing on, as we preach through Luke, the, there's a reason for the 12. The 12 apostles represent the renewed or the new Israel. 12 in is, you know, we're doing it, we just, we're starting a study, which I invite you to on Tuesday mornings at the Tuesday morning men's Bible study of the book of Revelation. And you know numbers are really important, right? So the number 12, which is not the number seven, seven being four plus three, okay? Three being the number for the Trinitarian Lord, okay? Four being the number representing the, the fullness of creation, like the four corners of the earth, the four corners of all, all the heavens, that kind of thing. Uh, it's not four plus three, that's seven a completeness number of the intersection of God with his creation, okay? But four times three is used very specifically for kingdom reign and governmental reference. Hence, there are 12 tribes of Israel, okay? And hence, when Jesus establishes uh, and brings forward his new or renewed Israel, under the foundations of the uh, apostles, you have 12, right? Okay. So Jesus gathers with his 11 apostles. And uh, why are there only 11? Somebody's missing. Judas, Judas right? And we don't have Matthias yet. He, he, is, uh, he is named by Peter and the other apostles after the ascension. Okay, that's later on in Acts 1, okay, as you move on. But back in Matthew 28, which is before the ascension into heaven, Jesus gathers with the 11, and he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, okay? So in other words, we're sending the 12, the renewed Israel, now to evangelize all the Gentiles too. Got it? Okay. Um, and what are, what are they supposed to do? Remember, this is not just kind of randomly. It's not like Jesus rounded up two or three of the latest converts. He's with the apostles. Okay, y'all hearing this, right? Um, and he, he, he commands them and commissions them to go baptizing them, these new disciples from all the nations, okay? Look at this, in the name of the Father, and implicitly in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's clearly a Trinitarian affirmation and formula by Jesus for baptism, right? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And by implication, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Got it? and teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. 
Well, what does this situation beg? Okay, it begs the question, what are the apostles supposed to be teaching? And notice that the authority is extended with the commission specifically to the apostles. Again, not Billy Joe and Susie Q who just happen to become converts and don't know a whole lot. This is to the apostolic leadership. Do y'all follow me? So obviously, we would be interested in, well, what, what did the early church extend key core teaching to people who were being baptized and affirming Christian faith? That flows in with the history of the fact that, as Reed mentioned on July 1st, excuse me, July 5th, uh, the Apostles' Creed was used and still continues to be used in a lot of churches in connection with baptism of people who are coming to faith the catechumenate is what they're called in the early centuries of the church. Those who are, they believe in Jesus, but in the early church, you know, they're not going around just saying, well, great, um, you, you've invited Jesus into your heart, let's baptize you in five minutes. They're training them up in what this is talking about with the commission, do you see this? Teaching them to affirm and obey. And obviously you could say, well, what they need to do is every single person who becomes a Christian needs to be able to recite and put into practice everything that we read in the New Testament and probably with co-reference to the Old Testament. But let me ask you this, how many of you can pull up in your brains right now the entirety of the New Testament with co-reference to the Old Testament? Just if, if I started giving you a pop quiz right now, some of you would run out pretty quickly of answers, wouldn't you? So it's helpful with believers to say, well, what are the core basic beliefs to, to come in under this, you know, like you should be a baptized affirming Christian, okay? This all makes sense actually when you start thinking about it, doesn't it? So hence we get this, um, this the, what's called the Apostles' Creed in the church in the, in the West use this to work with you know, new Christians, the catechumenate as they prepared for baptism and that they would respond in connection with baptism with this. Um, so here are the, uh, you can see the, the 12 articles. I'll just read through these, you know these. I'm giving us our version that we typically use of the Apostles' Creed. There are various versions with various language and you know, variations, okay? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. That's a reference, of course, to the first person of the Trinity and belief in, in him. Now notice this, you notice this, I have this believe in emphasized there for you in bold and italics. That's a Martin emphasis. I want you all to see that, okay? I believe in. Now notice the next time we get an in, and that leads into the belief in the second person of the Trinity who is Jesus Christ. His only begotten, well, begotten, some versions of the Apostles' Creed have that. It's definitely in the Nicene Creed, some versions that we, we, we don't include that in what we say on Sundays, but um, Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost. Ghost is old English, well, ghost comes from old English language, you know, geist for um, Anglo-Saxon for spirit, right? So uh, the Holy Ghost, we're pretty traditional here, so we're still using Holy Ghost, okay. Um, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. Uh, and by the way, on the, the descended into hell, like Reed said a couple of weeks ago, there's lots of churches that say he descended to the dead, or he just, you know, they, they have all kinds of variations on this, okay. Um, some say, you know, go ahead and like correct it and say he descended into Hades which would be more correct, you know, maybe, you know. Reed talked about that a couple weeks ago. Um, third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living, okay, or the quick, again, we're using the really old Anglo-Saxon kind of language here, the quick and the dead. And notice, now we get the third in. Do y'all see this? and it matches out with the third person of the Trinity. Because by the way, I can believe, like for the forgiveness of sins, but I do that through believing in the work of the Holy Spirit, okay? My faith is in God. 
This is central to the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed. This is basic 101 faith, but it's easy to just kind of miss this. When you say the Apostles' Creed, you are saying your faith is in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's where your faith is anchored and lodged, and it is in him, the living God. Do you all get the difference? Then flowing from that, you may believe a lot of things that the Bible teaches you that God wants you to believe, but your belief is in God. Okay? Got it? We're supposed to understand that. We're supposed to teach that to our children. We're supposed to, when people ask us, you know, who are interested in finding out about Christianity, we're supposed to say our belief is in the Father. Our belief is in Jesus Christ the Son. Our belief is in the Holy Spirit. And then we believe certain things that flow from that belief in God. Right? Okay. All right. So I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And then we usually tag it with an amen, which comes from, it's true, I affirm this, from, you know, the Hebrew amun, okay, which means it's true, I, I affirm it, okay, I believe it. So um, that's the Apostles' Creed, the, the 12 articles. You all see the way they're broken out as 12 articles. And the tradition, which is a nice tradition, but we don't have <laughs> historic credibility to this per se, is that each of the apostles, you know, added, you needed to get all 12 together, and they each had their own, you know, line that they added to the Apostles' Creed. That's a legendary type of thing, you know. Uh, but, uh, but the apostolic line or foundation from the early church is there roughly speaking, okay? This is the historic faith of the faithful Orthodox Church in the West about a belief in God. So uh, now, Reed talked a couple weeks ago about the fact that there's creedal affirmations in the New Testament. I want to go back over, well, I'm going to introduce some that we didn't have time to study last time because we were going into the issue of descent into hell pretty, you know, pretty promptly. Uh, but let's just go back. This is one that we looked at, I believe, a couple weeks ago. Actually, let me start. I'm going to start in reverse order with Hebrews 6, verses 1 and 2. Now, listen to this, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. As you know, maybe you don't know this. Let me explain this to you. Hebrews is kind of like the advanced, one of the advanced courses in the New Testament, okay? Um, Mark, you might use during the freshman year, so to speak. Hebrews is, you know, covering all this imagery and all this Old Testament background that you really kind of need to know. So the writer of Hebrews really wants to move on to, you know, upper level study and thinks that Christians need to not keep saying, now, now, wait a minute, let me get this straight. Jesus is the Son of God? Is he really God? And, you, you know, like after five years, you're hoping that people who are coming to church and doing Bible study and professing their faith don't need to go back over that again and again, right? That's kind of the way in which the writer of Hebrews is addressing his audience, an audience that's very confused and has really gotten into angels, and they're sending, you know, cards of... I'm joking right now, but they're sending cards of angels, and they have all the, when you go to ha eat dinner with them, they have all these, you know, angels out on their tables and stuff because they're really into angels. And the writer of the Hebrews is saying, why are you getting off into angels? We, we actually know the living Son of God. The angels are <laughs> infinitely lower <laughs> than the Son of God. Y'all, stop being all into angels and going back to old, you know, Judaic, um, Old Testament you know, kosher laws and stuff like that. Look, let's, let's, you, you should be advanced beyond that. Well, in the midst of saying this, look at Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ. Now, that doesn't mean it's not essential and foundational, but he's like, look, come on. <laughs> like, y'all actually need to mature as people who understand the Bible and understand your faith. So he says, therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again 
a foundation of repentance from dead works. Paul talks about that a lot. You know, it's like, look, Paul's already covered this ground. I don't need to go, you know, read Paul, and you need to learn it, and you need to move on. Come on, let's go. Uh, not laying, again, a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, okay, and of instruction about washings. This is probably reference to sacramental baptismal and sanctific basic sanctification and salvation. The laying on of hands, in other words, ordination and sending and calling, and, and, and laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Now, you'll see that he's just covered a lot that's in the Apostles' Creed, right? So let me ask you this. Based on what the writer of the Hebrews is saying, do we just stop with the Apostles' Creed and that's kind of all we need to know? No, obviously not. But do we always need to know the Apostles' Creed and affirm it? You know, do we always need to affirm the types of things that... Uh, He's talking about repentance from dead works and, you know, um, the laying on of hands, the resurrection, uh, the judgment that Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead. Obviously, we need to know that, right? But he's ready to move on with his people. So that's Hebrews, but you just see that little echo of creedal affirmation going on there. Y'all see that, right? Okay. All right. Now, let's go back to some creedal affirmations in um, the New Testament. So, actually, I just opened it up to this, so I'm just going to go to this. Romans 1. This is uh, Paul, and he introduces himself as a bond slave or slave or servant of Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. And then he says, in the middle of uh, the second half of verse 1 of Romans 1, set apart for the gospel of God. What's he going to lead into with the gospel of God? Now, I want you all to see this. This is very creedal, what he gives us at the beginning of Romans. Which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the holy scriptures. Now, really, now we're really getting into it. Concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh. Y'all see that, right? That's a creedal type statement hooking together all kinds of scripture from the Old Testament, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So we've got a reference there to God, to Jesus the Son of God, and to the Holy Spirit. And when Paul Oftentimes when Paul says God, he means, and Carl, we talked about this on, in Revelation on uh, Tuesday morning, yesterday morning. A lot of times in the New Testament when you hit just a, a, a generalized God, you're talking about God the Father. Now, Jesus is also God. The Holy Spirit's also God. But a lot of times when you get God, Jesus, his son, what does that tell you? You just, you just had a reference to God the Father, right? Jesus, his son, and the Holy Spirit. You've got a Trinitarian creedal type of affirmation there that Paul opens with in Romans chapter 1. Now, let's also go in Romans, because he kind of picks this back up very much later. In Romans chapter 8, um, just, just one little snippet here. Verse 34. Who is to condemn? Now, he's in rhetoric right now when he asks that question, but now then get this little creedal snippet here. Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. That's a creedal affirmation. Do you all see that there? In response to the rhetorical question, he's coming back with a snippet of an early Christian. This is like Paul is early you know, the first decades of the Christian church, okay? And you see these creedal affirmations that pop up in Paul um, that, that, are, that are quite strong. Uh, now, as long as I'm in Romans, let me just go on over to uh, <clears throat> Romans 10. Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. 
Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, the earliest creedal affirmations of the Christian church, which are baked into all, you know, that proliferate throughout the New Testament, are, are these. Jesus is Lord and Jesus Christ is Lord. Those are creedal affirmations. In fact, to say the, the, the word and the title together, Jesus Christ, is a creedal affirmation. You are saying that Jesus is the anointed, the Messiah of God. Y'all follow me? Do y'all have questions about that? If you say Jesus with Christ, and you're saying it in a reverent, faith-based way, you are making a creedal affirmation, and it is the, it's central. And when you say, this is a salvific kind of creedal affirmation, that Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, is Lord, so you've just said, I believe in Jesus Christ as God. You've just made a salvific creedal affirmation. Y'all with me on that? And that runs all through the New Testament. Okay, so anyway, just look at this. So um, back to this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, okay, you see why Paul's making such a big deal of this, right? In the Greek version of the Old Testament, or the Greek versions of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, the term kyrios, which can just mean like high-level sir or nobility, like the House of Lords in you know, England or something like that, but in the, in the Septuagint, that term, kurios, is used to translate the personal name for God, Yahweh, predominantly. So when you get to the Greek New Testament, understanding that in the old Greek Old Testament, kurios is used in place of, you know, Yahweh and Adonai, and you start saying that Jesus is Lord, you are affirming his divinity. You're also affirming something else, too. In the Roman Empire, um, you were supposed to say in allegiance that Caesar was Lord because he was the boss of the world. Okay? So when the Romans said that, they said he's boss of the world, and the Romans also thought from Julius Caesar to Caesar Augustus onward, they thought their Caesars were divine or on their way to becoming gods by the time they die. So the Christians are like, no, no, no. I don't believe that Tiberius is Lord. I believe that Jesus, the anointed of God, is Lord. That's what the Christians are saying. That's a creedal affirmation. So Paul, Paul's picking up on all that here. Um, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So Paul just told you that salvation and justification by faith, it's central and obvious that you're going to be making creedal affirmations. So let me just tell you, when you run into people who say, I don't believe in any of that creed stuff, you say, okay, you want to excise most of the New Testament out of the New Testament? Because it doesn't make sense. You, you've got it baked in and developing in the New Testament. Y'all see this, right? Y everybody see this? Anybody confused on this? It's all, it's, okay, it's, it's in here. Now, let's go over to a, um, some even more obvious ones. Okay, I just turned over to Colossians, so we'll go to Colossians next. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15, and I'm going to read through, I think, verse 22, 23. I believe Reed hit this last time in our brief introduction. I can't remember, but anyway, we're just going to do it again. Who is Jesus? Well, Colossians chapter 1, picking up at verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of or over all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. 
He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in, by the way, you've just had an affirmation of the resurrection from the dead. Y'all see this? Notice that firstborn from the dead. Well, wait a minute. If he never went to the dead, how's he the firstborn from the dead? Okay, I'm just this descended into hell thing has really got me off on this. It's like, how? Are you, what are you going to do with all these scriptures? Okay, he's consistently referred to, repeatedly referred to, as he's raised from the dead. Okay, anyway, uh, firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, look at this, all, not a minor sliver, a minor introduction, all the fullness, the pleroma of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Now, look at this, because Paul, Paul and the other New Testament writers do this quite a bit. This does not mean you can lose your salvation if you're truly saved, but it does mean if you're saved, you want to hold fast to the faith, and if you're truly saved, you will hold fast to the faith. These, these little tags get in, in before these creedal statements or after them a lot. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. That's how we're saved, through his death. In order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed, this is the verse, the final verse on this, verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. He's saying these creedal affirmations and the basic affirmations I have taught you and that are infused for us all through the New Testament, you better not, you better not, you know, tail off on them. You better hold fast to them. Well, I'm kind of, I'm kind of having a new exploration about who Jesus is. Or maybe, maybe it really is true that this is a big issue in the, you know, early centuries with docetism, Gnosticism, and various mystical understandings. Um, you know, God... Um, God is very spiritual. God didn't create this fallen world. That's kind of a lower God, or that came about through something else, you know. And it's like, no, no, no. God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything. And you got this from Colossians, right? All things visible and invisible. Do y'all see that? That is in response to issues that were going on in the first century, as well as certainly later it speaks to issues in the second, third centuries as well. I mean, heresies and other religions that say, yeah, we like Jesus, but we have, you know, it's kind of like Hinduism likes Jesus, you bring him into Hinduism. Uh, Muhammad acknowledges Jesus as a prophet, you bring him into sideways over here, you know, it's like, no, 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 no. He's either everything or he's nothing at all. And he's the creator of all things, visible and invisible. There's not different spheres of, you know, God's involved in some spheres but not others. Y'all see that? And that goes back into your first um, article of the Apostles' Creed. Um, it's reflected in that. You notice this now. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of what? Heaven and earth. Okay? It's a big issue with, you know, Nicaea, et cetera. Okay. Uh, so you see this. Well, let's let's keep going. Let me give you a few more of these. Uh, this is just it's 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 really good for you to see these. Uh, let's go to Titus. Titus three. So Titus three. Three, pick up at verse three and go through, really seven. Um, but I'll, I'll I'll tag the verse eight too. Um, so, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. This is, this is like the big affirmation here at verse 4. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, 
but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. So in other words, if you actually believe the, these affirmations, you're going to live a life of faithfulness, doing good works, understanding you're not saved by good works, but because of who God is, you'll live a life of faithfulness and do good works and hold fast to the faith. That's the idea that you just get over and over again in the New Testament. Um, okay, let's see. I know I wanted to, yeah, 1 Timothy 3.16. This one's really quite simple and beautiful. Three, verse 16. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. Now, you see in the ESV translation, it's got this poetically kind of creedally before y'all. Do you see that? Okay. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. So there you're running all the way through the incarnation, all the way through the ascension. You all see that, right? It's, it's a very tight and powerful creedal affirmation there. Okay. Um, now, oh, I've got this on the second page. But let me go ahead now. At the bottom of the first page, I'm going to go ahead and read to you from 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, picking up at verse 1, but we're really interested primarily um, in the middle of verse 3 onward. Now, I would remind you, Paul says, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you, you notice the same kind of language again, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you. In other words, you know, you, you don't want to be the kind of shallow ground that, like, received the seed joyfully, but actually you're not really in faith. You're not really saved in faith, okay? Um, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. Now, what does that mean? Paul uses this language in several locations in his letters. It's obvious when he says that. This is not something that originates with him. You remember how Paul, after Jesus calls him, goes and is confirmed by the apostles, the other apostles? You all remember this, right? Okay. So this is apostolic teaching. It clearly seems to be apostolic teaching that he's drawing upon here. So he received this just like he received the, uh, you know how he says he received, he delivered to us what he received, the institution of the Lord's Supper? By the way, was Paul there in the upper room at the Lord's Supper? So it's imperative that he receive from the, you know, the, from the apostles what's going on in the upper room, right? What's going on with the communion, the Last Supper? Okay. So use the same kind of language here. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. And here it is. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Uh, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Okay? Now, let's, let's move on. We're going to move on like 1,500 years, <laughs> okay, or nearly 1,500 years. Uh, the early Protestant reformers in the 16th century knew that the original apostles had not authored the Apostles' Creed. They all knew that. They understood that. Nevertheless, they affirmed the historic orthodox bona fides of the creed and employed the creed and specific biblical theological explorations of the 12 articles in order to organize and to teach 
the evangelical faith, I'm using that term to refer to like Protestant faith at the time, okay, of Luther and Calvin and Bayes and those people, um, and to support uh, biblical and historic and apostolic continuity in the evangelical faith. In other words, the Protestants, and Calvin is really into this, Luther's really into this, they're saying, look, no, 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 we're not an aberration. We're being most consistent with the early centuries of the church and the apostolic teaching. And therefore, they totally, a lot of times, frame their teaching. Calvin does a lot of this in the Institutes, and you see this in Luther's Shorter Catechism. You see this in the Heidelberg Catechism. Um, Levinius, you know, his, his exposition of um, the Apostles' Creed, as well as his work on the Heidelberg Catechism, they're all using the Apostles' Creed. Okay. So in the main, line, main lines, original lines of the Protestant Reformation, other than Anabaptist, which is not what we are, okay, uh, the Apostles' Creed is there. Now, let's go to uh, what, is the, what, what is a creed and what is the Apostles' Creed? Well, we've already introduced this kind of creedal language all through the New Testament, but let's just fill in the blank here. If you don't have a pencil or pen, you can do it later. Credo... In, okay, what does that mean? That's Latin. That's I believe in, okay? In what do you believe? In whom do you believe? This is why I ask, you know, we, we always ask the question, in whom do you believe? Because remember, you're believing in God, okay? And then you believe things that flow out of that belief in God. Uh, your foundation is in God, though. Who saved you? Uh, did, like, did Isaiah save you? Did Moses save you? No, Jesus saved you. You better profess faith in Jesus, right? Okay. So um, the other thing here is, I just went ahead and put it there. Um, Pastuum and es, uh, that's, and then chi, es. In the, in the Greek, in the Nicene Creed, that you see that es term there, that Epsilon, Iota, Sigma thing there. That means into. Into. In John's gospel, like in the Greek, when John is talking about whoever believes into him, right? You need to believe into Jesus. Once you are received in, then you also believe, in the Greek it's Epsilon, noon, uh, in, okay, on, Okay, but how do I get in? What does Jesus say? He says, I'm, I'm the gate, right? <laughs> I'm the shepherd. I'm, so, like, how do I get, you know, by the way, how am I going to get into heaven? Am I going to work my way in, figure my way in? No, Jesus says, I will come and bring you to be with me. So, even further, more precisely than you believe in, you believe first and foremost and threshold-wise into God the Father. You believe into Jesus the Son. You believe into, like you become one with Jesus. Do y'all get this? You come in through Jesus. It's not a head game. The New Testament is not into head games. We tend to think like, oh, well, this is just a head game. I kind of, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I assent to that. Okay, that makes sense to me. No, no, that's not what this is talking about. This is like, I'm all in. I totally throw myself into Jesus, and I come in through him. That's what that language means. This language is actually very strong. It's not just kind of nice, fluffy language that we say in church. It's huge. You have to get this. It's basic to the gospel. Everybody understand this? You believe into God the Father. You believe into Jesus. You believe into the Holy Spirit. And you become one with God. You in Christ, Christ in you. Okay. Uh, so anyway, that's there. You want to you want to catch that. So I've got a whole lot of scripture cited here. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. You see all the scripture. We don't have time to go through that. Y'all can take this home and read these scriptures if you want to. These citations. Um, let me just go on down because, like I said, I just kind of got a little bit interested in. Although Reed has done a lot of spade work with the descended into hell, let's just let me let's look at a few more scriptures on this, and I can look at maybe a few other ones too. 
Um, let's go down to Article 5. Um, and, and like I said, next week we'll pick this up and we'll move into um, believing into um, the Holy Ghost and through the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. We'll talk about how that, that flows from your believing into the Holy Spirit, okay? The Holy Spirit's going to draw you into that story. But that's just a preview for next week, okay? So right now, let's just go ahead and go down to this uh, Article 5 and then Article 6. Um, well, excuse me, Article 4 first. Uh, um, dead. He's, he's, he's dead. He's crucified dead. There's multiple scriptures on this dead, Article 4, and buried. He descended into hell. Let's look. These are ones that we did not cover last week, so I'm going to throw in a few more or a couple weeks ago. Let's just get some more of these points of reference. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Verse 24. Um, Peter is in the midst of preparing to quote back to um, Psalm 16, but let's just look at this. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Verse 25, for David says concerning him, this is Psalm 16 now, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad, my tongue rejoiced, my flesh will dwell in hope. For you did not abandon my soul to Hades, but Sheol in the like Old Testament, okay? Or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set up one of his descendants on his throne. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades. Okay? Nor did his flesh see corruption. Okay? So, he's saying that the Lord did not leave that the father did not leave the son in the pangs of Hades, okay? But he didn't leave him there because he raised him up, right? So the seeming implication is what are you going to do with the fact that all this is talking about his soul being in Hades, but he was not abandoned to there? That's just a note on the, you know, huge, strong, like there's no way objections to the descended language. Okay. Now let's move on. Any questions on that? Y'all see that, right? Uh, then let's let's move on to another one. Um, Matthew twelve verse forty. This is from Jesus. For just as Jonah, this is Jesus talking now. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, if Jesus was immediately with the Father, because he made that statement to the, which is an eschatological today, it's not a literal today, okay. What are you going to do with this? Was Jesus confused at this point? Y'all see this, right? Um, okay, um, Romans 10. So in addition to Jesus himself talking about being, you know, there, uh, let's, let's, let's move on. Romans. No, it's, that's a complicated reference that Jesus is making because he's, he's making a um, prophetic statement that plays off of Jonah, right? 
So Jesus touches three days, um, but he's not literally there for three, yeah. So that's a complicated reference, but he clearly is talking about being down before. And l let me just keep going on this. But yes, that Jonah thing is not, some people get confused about that. Jesus is making a prophetic allegorical kind of reference. He's not, Jesus does rise again on the third day, but you're not talking about three full days and certainly not three nights, right? Okay. You know the way the Jewish time frame is, uh, evening and morning. So Jesus is dead a little bit after three in the afternoon on Friday. So he's dead for late afternoon on Friday. That's, you know, certainly not full days, but that's a, you know, that day. Uh, the evening, right, heading, which, which is now Sabbath time. And then on Sunday morning, early, he rises again. So it's the third day from the crucifixion, but it's certainly not three days and three nights like a literal. That's not a literal thing on the, on the, the third day resurrection. It's more about, though, the sequence of, look, I'm going to be in the, in the earth. Okay. Um, so, um, and, and he's, he's, he's responding to, you know, asking for signs, which is a, a big issue all in, in his time and in the New Testament. Um, let's go to Romans 10, 6 and 7. We've already gone over to Romans. Uh, let's, let's go here to 10, 6 and 7. We looked at this. Let's, let's look at this again. Uh, this is lead up to the creedal faith statement I was giving you earlier. But... The righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. That's where he is now. Okay, he's in heaven. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. Now, the implication there is at some point Christ was in the abyss. Otherwise, what is Paul doing with that language? Do you all follow that? These are light touches but again, this like boilerplate, oh, there's no way, none of this is like, well, what are you going to do with all these scriptures? That's, that's my point. This was just kind of perturbing me as I looked at these scriptures. Um, and then, of course, the basic affirmation that Paul makes that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Not, well, Jesus was up, you know, with his father, and then, well, his body was down there, but, you know, there was some kind of like, point at which they were all, um, you know, like reunited and everything. Paul, Paul is perfectly fine. You know, Paul, Paul goes off on these long tangents if he wants to. He doesn't have anything in there about that. He just says, if you believe, it, if you believe that God raised him from the dead, what does the dead mean? That is where the dead are. Do you all follow me? It's not even the raised him from death. It's raised him from the dead. You will be saved. It's Romans 10. It's elsewhere in the New Testament. Raised from the dead. So this idea that Jesus was never in, you know, the dead, what are you going to do with these scriptures? Okay? This is not, it's just like, so, y'all see this, right? I mean, so I, I think it's okay for us to say in the Apostles' Creed, he descended. Um, all right. Now, let's see, uh, third day he rose again from the dead. Kind of back to your question here, Larry. Yeah, it's the, the way the sequence works. It's the third day, and that is, that's what actually happens historically. That's the way it works. Jesus dies on Friday afternoon. He's dead. The first day he's dead is just a couple hours, a few hours on Friday. He's dead on Saturday. He's dead for a short period of hours before dawn on uh, the third day, Sunday, okay? And then he rises before dawn, okay? The scripture is every, any, you know, th that this is repeated 800 times, you know, like you, you can't open the New Testament and not get that message, right? That he rose again, he rose from the dead, okay? He rose again, uh, sometimes he says rose again uh, on the, third day. 
Uh, we believe that, and let's just let me close with this too. Uh, we believe that, and so that is so central to our faith that I want to remind us all. You hear me saying this a lot, but I want to remind us all because, like, when I went, when, when I talked with our new covenant young people, a lot of them didn't understand this. Why do we worship on Sunday? Because it's the day of resurrection, number one. It's the day on which Jesus rose, and it's very specific. It's the beginning of the new creation. Do y'all follow that? Okay. It's the beginning, and his resurrection is the first fruits of the resurrection that is to come. And in the sequence of the law and... Um, the feast, the day of first fruits is the first day of the week following the Passover Sabbath, okay, when Jesus is dead, okay? So when Paul says in 1 Corinthians that Jesus is the first fruits showing us what our resurrection is going to be like, this is when they walked in with the beginning of the harvest, the first fruits of the harvest and dedicated those, waved those before the Lord God, okay? The day when that happens is the day that Jesus rose from the dead, literally. Do y'all, do y'all understand this? So ultimately, the reason that's in the law like it is is because it's prophesying Jesus' resurrection on the first day of the new week following the Passover and the Passover Sabbath. Jesus is the Passover, and in his resurrection, he's the first fruits. And the reason we worship, you know, we can worship any day of the week we want to. We can worship, certainly Wednesday night's a great night to worship. Um, You know, we don't have, we're not religiously tied to days per se. The New Testament teaches us that. But on the other hand, we especially set apart what's called the Lord's Day in the New Testament because it's the day of resurrection. And we believe Jesus rose from the dead and we are called in him into the new creation. Y'all get that? So anyway, that, and that's kind of built into the, that's by implication in the creed also. On the third day, he rose again, which is not just the third day, but also in the week sequence, it's the first day. Okay? Good? So the creed's pretty interesting, right? Okay, so next week we'll talk about uh, the Holy Spirit, or if you like the old language, Holy Ghost, okay? And um, how how we are brought together as God's people, and all this is applied to us uh, by the Holy Spirit. Good? All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for our time together to study your word and to study our faith through looking at the 12 articles, or at least some of the 12 articles, and rejoicing and finding our faith to which you, we, you call us, Lord, in you and into you. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen.